Let me tell you a little something about me and Gravity Falls. I didn't like it. I didn't love it. I lived it. I remember watching it when it first premiered, but it didn't get properly into the show until early 2015, about halfway through the second season. But by God, was it exciting. I can't think of another show quite like it. It's hilarious, it's heart-wrenching, it's horrifying, all blended together perfectly. And to be there, anticipating every episode only to then dissect it for theories and clues, as well as the killer gags, and it was such a wild ride. The cast and crew were all fantastic. I even once reached out to the series composer Brad Breek to praise him for his work, and he actually replied to me. And to top it all off, the series ended at just the right point, getting a proper conclusion instead of being either cut short or allowed to rot for all eternity. They called it the Fandom of Dreams. And it was. It really was. But enough of me gushing about the old times. I want to talk about the show itself, so if you haven't watched Gravity Falls, then go watch it. Seriously, it's a series you don't want spoiled. You're gonna love it, I'm sure. For those of you left, it's been 10 years since Gravity Falls premiered, and in celebration I tend to go episode by episode elaborating on elements I think are worth highlighting. And then for grins and giggles, I'll rank them, cause, I don't know, ranking videos do well on the YouTube algorithm, I think. Now keep in mind, this is a really solid series, so the distribution of quality is going to be tight. If I have your favorite episode near the bottom of my list, I assure you I still really like it. Now without further ado, let's jump in with Tourist Trapped. This is where it all started, and honestly it's a great beginning. Right away it establishes several strengths of the show. It has a rapid pace, which means that it can cover more ground, but it never feels too frantic either. For example, in this first episode, we meet Dipper and Mabel, the Grunkle Stan, Seuss and Wendy, the core of the cast. But we don't get a full rundown on Wendy and Seuss yet, because they're not important yet. The information is superbly paced both within episodes and between episodes. We also see Journal 3 for the first time, and just listen to this. It's hard to believe it's been six years since I began studying the strange and wondrous secrets of Gravity Falls, Oregon. Unfortunately, my suspicions have been confirmed. I'm being watched. I must hide this book before he finds it. God, it's crazy re-watching this and remembering a time when we didn't know who wrote this or what they were referring to. We get our first major twist when Mabel's boyfriend, whom she hopes is a vampire and Dipper thinks is a zombie, turns out to be a group of gnomes. And along with that twist is this moment. Guess again, sister. Shabam! Ah! Oh wait, I'm, so I'm sorry. Shabam! Foreshadowing disguised as a one-off gag, a technique that will continue to be used through the series. We also see established the heart of the show, which is the relationship between Dipper and Mabel, twin siblings based off of showrunner Alex Hirsch and his sister Ariel. And we see that they don't always get along, that there's friction between them as would be expected in any realistic sibling relationship, but at the end of the day they both get a turn to save the other. If this didn't work, the whole show wouldn't work. But it does work, so the show works. And then at the very end, we see a tease that Grunkle Stan is in fact hiding more than he lets on. This episode is such a great microcosm of the show. Everything people like about Gravity Falls is present here, and it sets up not only the emotional basis of the show, but also signals the direction that long-running mystery will go in. While of course it defaults at the number one spot, Tourist Trapped will stay there for some time. Legend of the Gobblewonker Again, the show is still starting out, and Legend of the Gobblewonker has an important job. While Two is Trapped told us what will be in the episodes, Gobblewonker reveals to us how the episodes relate to each other. And it does so right in the cold open. We didn't get any photos of those gnomes, did we? Nope, just memories. And this beard hair. Why did you save that? Mm -hmm. Unlike something like, say, this show's contemporary, Phineas and Ferb, where ridiculous and catastrophic things can happen and then things get reset to the status quo at the end of every episode, Gravity Falls has continuity. Bear in mind, that's not a knock against Phineas and Ferb because that's also a great series, but it has a different goal than Gravity Falls. Here, things that happen in one episode will matter in the next, and boom, established almost immediately. Now most of this episode revolves around showing us secondary or tertiary characters around town, and it is more humor based with the journals not really coming into play here. It's definitely got some great gags as the twins unravel the mystery of a lake beast reported by the town kook, Fiddleford. 
the episode also includes the most iconic line in the history of television. Wanna hear a joke? Here goes. My ex-wife still misses me, but her aim is getting better. Sheer poetry. I don't think it's comprehensive enough to unseat Tourist Trapped yet, but I think it's still a great episode nonetheless. Headhunters. Mabel's new wax statue of Stan is brutally murdered, and they have to track down the culprit as Stan mourns the loss of his doppelganger. At this point, I start to repeat myself, because virtually every episode in the series has at least one knee slapper joke and some kind of great mystery element. Plus, it also takes a step towards a more creepy atmosphere. I remember seeing this when it aired and thinking, wow, that's kind of scary for a Disney show. I had no idea what was coming. Taken against the rest of the series though, Headhunters ultimately doesn't do a lot to move the plot forward. As is, it feels like filler in comparison to some other episodes, but very very good filler nonetheless. So I will slide it down a bit. Episode 4, The Hand That Rocks the Mabel. Oh, now we're talking. The twins meet Gideon Gleeful, the child psychopath who takes a liking to Mabel. It does a good job of establishing him as a little gremlin who will go on to be a recurring villain in the series and developing a reason for him to be antagonistic towards the Pines family. This episode also carries a great message about setting boundaries and relationships that honestly I wish more media would talk about. I'm just really glad Mabel didn't settle on a we can at least be friends state with Gideon. She tells him off and that's honestly great to see. Kids need to see that. And then the episode ends with this moment. Oh, you'll see, boy. You'll see. In this one moment, the story has escalated. The existence of Journal 3 implies the existence of Journals 1 and 2. And if you hadn't been thinking of that, well, now you are. It solidifies Gideon's role as a nemesis and heightens the intrigue, and as a result, I feel comfortable sliding it near the top spot. The inconveniencing. Dipper and Mabel get to know Wendy and her friends and sneak out to go to an abandoned convenience shop that, surprise, turns out to be haunted. This also begins the arc of Dipper crushing on Wendy, which, to be fair, wasn't my favorite arc in the show, but that's just a personal preference. I think what helps it a lot, though, is that Wendy is actually a character and not just an object of affection. Mabel getting high on Smile Dip is also hilarious, and this was a great introduction to these side characters and a great way to properly introduce Wendy. I'll slide it right about here. Episode 6, Dipper vs. Manliness. This is another one of those Monster of the Week episodes. Dipper feels insecure about not being as masculine as people expect him to be, so he runs away in shame and encounters the Manitars. Half man, half, uh, half tour. Over the episode, he learns that there's not one right way to be a man, and that being an asshole about it isn't cool. Meanwhile, Mabel tries to hook up Grunkle Stan to Lazy Susan when he confesses a crush on her, which gets resolved in the after credits thing. Not a big impact on the show as a whole, gonna slip it a little lower on the ranking, but I do have to pause here and say that it's not a bad thing as a whole for some episodes to not actively advance the plot of the series. I prefer the episodes that are driving the plot, but it's nice to have breather episodes too. It helps the series as a whole by pacing things out better, then the episodes that do push the plot forward are more impactful. Anyways, moving on to Double Dipper, Stan holds a party at the Mystery Shack. Mabel meets Candy and Grenda, who become her close friends through the show. She also meets Pacifica, who becomes her nemesis. Dipper wants to dance with Wendy, but gets caught up in responsibilities, so he does what any normal kid would do. He uses a cursed photocopier to clone himself in order to get the helpers he needs to enact his 20-step plan. Obviously, this goes wrong, and he realizes that just talking to her like a human being works best. I initially had this lower on my ranking, but you know... This one does expand the world of Gravity Falls a bit more, introducing new characters, it's really good. I'll pop that in probably about here. Yeah, this is getting a little hard. Irrational Treasure. It's Pioneer Day in Gravity Falls, and Pacifica is being a snooty little piece of poo about her ancestor founding the town. She digs at Mabel for being weird, so the Mystery Twins decide to crack the long-hidden conspiracy about the truth of the town's founding. This one's another episode where it's mostly standalone hijinks, and there's not really any scare factor at play here. But it is a lot of fun. We're gonna have to break in. And those are your free Pioneer Day passes. And your balloons. Blue and pink. We're in. 
Stan losing his mind at everyone being old-timey is great. Quentin Trembley is the best American president, don't at me. And I like this nice little subversion at the end, where they find out Pacifica's family legacy is built on a fraud. Mabel does the usual Disney Channel shtick of, I don't need revenge, I'm happy just being me. And then Dipper has none of it. Nathaniel Northwest didn't found Gravity Falls and your whole family is a sham. Deal with it. What? Mom? Man, revenge is underrated. That felt awesome. Lots of fun. Stick it on the list there. Let's keep going. The Time Traveler's Pig. Yeah, so this one is a really big episode. Dipper's trying to impress Wendy, but he fails miserably. So he steals a time traveler's time machine to go back in time to change time until he hits the timeline where he succeeds, time. And of course, there's a good emotional story where Dipper learns that sometimes you can't control fate. But this also has an interesting ramification on the show. At the end of the episode, the time traveler's forced to go back to fix all of the mess that the twins left behind across the timeline. And he can start to see that he was, in fact, in the background of the show's first three episodes. And this starts to set up a new promise with the viewers. Background details that in most other shows are there just because have real payoffs in this series. There's a reward for being eagle-eyed and analytical. It's a brilliant way to set up the special relationship between the show and the viewer. And because of that, it goes near the top of the list. Episode 10, Fight Fighters. Dipper accidentally draws the ire of Wendy's boyfriend, Robbie, and gets challenged to a fight. Rather than face him, he summons video game fighter Rumble McSkirmish, but quickly loses control of the situation. The best part of this episode is the gags they do with the idea of a video game fight in the quote-unquote real world, ribbing the mechanics and tropes of the old Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat games. That's the thing with a lot of this series. I love the way that they take their concepts for each episode and really mine them for all they're worth. The unique animation on Rumble is also a lot of fun. This goes relatively high on the list. Episode 11, Little Dipper. Mabel begins to grow ever so slightly taller than Dipper, which sparks insecurity in him. He finds magical, size-changing crystals in the forest, but little Gideon gets hold of them too and tries to use them in an attempt to destroy the Pines family. He also reveals he wants to take control of the Mystery Shack, which supposedly has a powerful secret. Overall, a pretty good episode. Gideon's traumatized mother is both incredibly dark and hilarious. Gideon is a straight-up child psychopath, and it's great. I'll put it, uh, right here. Summerween. Okay, this episode is so good, guys. Now, it's worth noting that the first season of Gravity Falls has both more light-hearted episodes like Fight Fighters, and then... this! Disney famously borrowed a spin the bottle joke in this episode, and you can see the remains on the flyer here. S&P is standards and practices, aka the Disney censors. So, spin the bottle is too risque, but this goes over just fine. My name is Gordy. Oh, remember me? Anyways, it's Summerween and Gravity Falls, Halloween and Summer. And Dipper is caught between trick-or-treating with Mabel like they always loved to do, and proving himself as a mature, cool kid to Wendy. But his lack of Summerween spirit summons the Summerween Trickster, who threatens to eat them if they can't collect enough candy by the end of the night. The Trickster is a great monster for this episode, but the real reason I like this one so much is this conversation Dipper and Mabel have when she realizes that Dipper had been intending to abandon her to go to Wendy's party. I just... I felt like I was getting a little too old to go trick-or-treating. That's exactly why we need to go trick-or-treating, Dipper. We're getting older. There's not that many Halloweens left. I guess I didn't realize it was already our last one. This conflict is the first real iteration of what the climax of the show will be about. It highlights the character flaws. Dipper wants to grow up too fast. Mabel doesn't want to grow up at all. It gives this episode more substance. It may not move the main plot forward, but it does deliver important character development. There's a lot to love in Summerween. It's super good, and that's why it's catapulting itself to the top of the list so far. 
Boss Mabel. Mabel thinks Stan is being too mean to everyone, and so challenges him to a bet to see if she can make more money with her nicer approach. I think this is a good point to talk about Stan as a character. Stan is, to put it simply, an asshole. He's also my favorite character in the entire series. There's a deft balance to him. He's a jerk and a swindler, but also has a heart beneath his old crusty facade. He's not overly cruel, and if he ever crosses a line, there's karmic retribution in store for him. Also, he just has the best lines in the show. You know, studies show that keeping a ladder inside the house is more dangerous than a loaded gun. That's why I own 10 guns, in case some maniac tries to sneak in a ladder. My light! You're the light of my life too, pal. Welcome to 1863! I will break you, little man! He's larger than life for reasons I can't even fully explain, and having him be a central part of the conflict here is a lot of fun. On an additional note, I also want to point out the trend of each episode having a different conflict, a different kind of conflict, and different characters in those conflicts. Not every episode has a monster of the week or sibling rivalries. The series doesn't have a neat little formula. It keeps things feeling fresh, and allows for characters to develop more as we see them in unique situations. As for the episode itself, it's pretty damn good. I love the Mabel-focused story it has, it has an interesting moral about how being tough is sometimes necessary, great jokes, and it adds interesting nuance to the characters. I'll put that a little higher on the list. Bottomless Pit an anthology of three shorts all compiled together, framed as stories the Pines family tell each other as they fall into the bottomless pit. Nothing super consequential happens in this episode as a result. It's basically filler. That said, it is fun filler, and these are concepts that I think would have been weaker to see as full episodes, but were nice to see in this format. I'll slide it right in there. The Deep End. A trip to the pool results in Mabel finding a new boyfriend who's a mermaid and decides to help him escape his watery prison back to the ocean. Debra also tries to get a job alongside Wendy, but to do so he has to please Mr. Poolcheck, a hilariously unhinged man. Stan has a rivalry with Gideon, who, may I remind you, is literally a little kid over a pool chair, and it's so freaking funny. <laughs> yes, yes, burn the child. Yeah, this is another real banger. Dipper eventually gives up his job to help Mabel, who in turn helps Mermando, which is a good and meaningful moment. I'm gonna set this a little on the higher side. Carpet Diem Dipper and Mabel are starting to get on each other's nerves as roommates. When a new room gets discovered in the shack, Stan decides to organize a contest to see who gets it. Whoever can suck up to him the most will get to keep the room. Things get complicated when a mysterious carpet switches Dipper's and Mabel's bodies. Overall, pretty good, has some interesting tidbits of lore that clue us into the bigger mystery at play, and there's a fun moment where the carpet switching gets entirely out of hand. But while it's a nice ending to have Dipper and Mabel decide they still want to share rooms after all, it does have an, and then it went all back to normal, vibe at the end of the episode, and Gravity Falls generally doesn't do that. Still a good episode, but after some really great ones, I don't think it's quite as strong. Boys Crazy Mabel and her pals find out their favorite boy band is artificially engineered by a corporate bigwig. Uh, no, I mean for real, they're actually genetically engineered. They try to rescue them, but Mabel gets a little too clingy, becoming the very evil she wanted to destroy. But eventually she sees the error of her ways and lets them free. Meanwhile, Dipper finds out Robbie has been using mind control music on Wendy, and exposes his lie. And of course, now that he's saved her from the evil boyfriend, He's free to try and date her as a good guy he- Are you serious? Right now? Ugh! What is wrong with guys? You only think about yourselves! All of you should just leave me alone! God, that's refreshing. Yeah, the way that this show handles the love interest arc is really good, and it subverts expectations in a way that makes Wendy's character better. She's not the love interest, she's an actual character with her own agency, and it makes this kind of cliché that I typically can't stand actually good. All that said, the episode is a bit dated, literally. 2013! But it's got the usual strengths. It's still funny, has a unique story. I'm gonna slide it in right there. Episode 18, The Land Before Swine. Stan needs to babysit Waddles. Mabel tells him not to put the pig outside. Stan puts the pig outside. The pig gets snatched by a flying pterodactyl. Daniel, 
I'll have you know that's a pterosaur, and one missing pigna fibers at that. Pterodactyl is but an informal term that derives from the pterodactylus genus. Ah, uh, right, sorry. Well, uh, anyways, Stan has to cover up his lie and try to get Waddles back along with the rest of the family. At the same time, the twins are concerned about how helpful Seuss will be with their mission. It's one of the more complex and dramatic conflicts so far in the series, and I think it's pulled off very well. Stan's arc takes a trope I usually don't like, the wire revealed, and makes it actually work. Because rather than being irrationally angry at Stan for the mere act of lying, as the trope usually plays out, Mabel is very rationally angry at him because it turns out he did not listen to her and selfishly put her beloved pig in danger. It's not the lie that upset her, it's the wrongdoing he covered up with it. But he redeems himself by realizing how important Waddles is to her and how it'll hurt Mabel if any harm comes to him. And so, he punches a pterodactyl... A, a pterosaur in the face to save Waddles, and the twins learn to value Seuss's contributions to their team. Overall, a very, very solid episode. I'm putting it on the higher end for sure. Dreamscaperers. It's time to unlock the journal's greatest secret. Yes, this is where Bill Cipher, the series' ultimate antagonist, first appears. At least, first appears in person, because he's been everywhere in the background and in the opening titles. Gideon summons the Dream Demon as a way to crack Stan's mind and get the deed to the Mystery Shack, which will give him control over it. I know that's not how property law works, it's a cartoon, sit down. So the Pines family have to go into Stan's mindscape to find Bill and stop him. Along the way we see more flashes of Stan's memories and backstory. It's a really cool episode that marks a new phase in the series, with Mabel's sweater depicting a sunset symbolizing a new, darker storytelling style. And it ends on a jaw-dropping cliffhanger, with Gideon actually taking the shack for himself. But all that said, coming back to this and seeing how powerful Bill is in the future, it's kind of funny seeing him get so easily defeated this time around. I know from behind-the-scenes info that, at first, Bill was going to have a more harmless and mischievous role in the show. I wonder if that was still the mindset here, or if they just weren't sure what was going to happen with him yet. The episode is a great segue into the next part of the show, but comprehensively, I'd probably put it as a more middle-tier episode so far. Gideon Rises, the season finale where Gideon has seized control of the Mystery Shack. Dipper and Mabel are trying whatever they can to get it back, but not only do they fail, they also lose Journal 3. Gideon is convinced that by uniting the journals, he'll unlock some kind of ultimate power, which, yeah, looking at him, that'd be pretty bad. We also get this moment, one of my favorite in the series, but it's not a great gag or a particularly scary monster. It's this scene where Stan is calling the twins' parents, letting them know what has happened. He tries to play it cool even though they're all crashing at Seuss's place and are running out of food and money. It's a rare serious moment that shows that he's not invincible. He's run out of tricks and cons. It's a subtly adult moment, the dread of not being able to care for someone you want to care for. And he even does give up and sends the kids home, until Gideon takes his giant death robot and chases after them. A robot built by Old Man McGucket, another example of taking something established in previous episodes and reincorporating it in a meaningful way. In the final showdown, Mabel is captured and Dipper is injured and... Is that blood? Oh my god, I can't believe Disney allowed that much. Dipper for a second lets his insecurities get the better of him. He lost the journal. He lost everything. He's just a loser again. He can't do anything to help. Before taking a running leap and attacking a giant robot. A big moment that proves the Dipper has more to him than just being the mystery kid. So yeah, Gideon gets defeated and exposed, and they return to the mystery shack. For the first time, Dipper and Mabel also offer the journal to Stan, explaining the crazy things they've done with it. But he laughs it off, cynic he is, as more superstitions dreamt up by the town's residents. That is, until we see him go behind the vending machine again. And this time, we see what he's hiding. A hidden control room, journal one, and a massive device. There's no real idea what it is yet, but from what we know of Gideon's search, it's something dangerous. Here we go. And then the show went on hiatus for a full year before Season 2 came out. 
But anyways, yes, Gideon Rises is a fantastic season finale. It wraps up the main conflict of the season and sows the seeds for the future story. It gives us answers which lead to more questions. The stakes were a lot higher while not sacrificing the fun and charm of the series. A very strong note to leave us hanging on. I'll put it at the very top of the list. We're now at the halfway point of the show, and you can see my rankings so far here. You got a top five episodes of the season right up here, but again, the distribution on this whole list is super narrow. I feel bad for putting Headhunters at the bottom because it's still a great episode. That's just how great the season is, even its weakest episode is really good. Now, for the authentic Gravity Falls experience, you have to wait a full year before I review season two. Yeah, I know, I'm not fooling anyone. Let's jump into the next season with... Episode 21, Scary Oki. Picking up right where the previous season left off, we see Stan with the mysterious device, as well as government agents picking up traces of activity. When they come to investigate, Dipper is all too eager to help them. Stan, obviously, has no intention of letting them snoop around. But Dipper meets with them anyways, and accidentally raises a zombie army, which leads to this incredible line. Dipper, what's the one thing I asked you not to do tonight? Raise the dead. And what did you do? Raise the dead. Now, I like how this episode has an interesting parallel to Two Wrists Trapped, which had Dipper obsessed over zombies. In this episode, the zombies finally come out to play. It's darker than Gravity Falls has been up to this point, and scarier. That's a big trend with this season, it feels like it's allowed to be riskier than the previous one. Scary Oki establishes that very clearly, the show has changed. The stakes are higher now. Dipper almost dies right here, like, oh my god! But Stan saves them and reveals that he did, in fact, believe in the supernatural all along. And after defeating the zombies, it's clear that there's a new understanding between the family, but still secrets being held on all sides. Much like Tourist Trapped, it's a great introduction to a new season, and it sets the staging for the rest of the story. From here on out, the serial storytelling gets emphasized even more over the episodic, and the refocus feels natural. It gets a high spot on the chart here. Into the Bunker With the discovery of the journal's blacklight pages, Dipper leads Mabel, Seuss, and Wendy to try and discover the author's whereabouts, and he believes the author is holed up in a secret tree bunker in the woods. Inside, they find doomsday preparations, a mysterious laptop that's a big clue for the main mystery, and a man who turns out to be a shapeshifter. And this shapeshifter is probably one of the more messed up things the show has to offer. Should I be one or the other? How about both? Jesus Christ! So, uh, yeah, if the previous episode wasn't enough of a clue, Into the Bunker destroys any doubts the season has a lot more leeway. Also, this episode has Dipper finally confess his feelings to Wendy, and she sits down and talks to him that it's just not going to work out. So that basically concludes the love interest arc, and she no longer appears in the show now that she's not an object of desire for the protagonist. Oh. Wait, sorry, I forgot, the show is actually good, because of course she stays around in a prominent role, because she's an actual character. Yeah, this episode really wraps up the romance arc in the best possible way, and combine it with the WHAT THE HELL THEY LET THIS AIR ON THE DISNEY CHANNEL factor this entry has, Into the Bunker is another entry near the top. But seriously, this episode gets so messed up. And this will be the last form you ever take! This kid's gonna need so much therapy. Episode 23, The Golf War. Mabel and Pacifica butt heads over mini golf. Or should I say they putt heads? <laughs> I'm sorry. As Mabel practices though, she discovers an entire civilization of golf ball people who control the mini golf course. She tries to enlist them for help, but it goes awry and she feels bad about cheating Pacifica. This episode also shows us a new side to Pacifica's personality, showing her interactions with her parents and how she may, in fact, be merely a product of their upbringing. And I like this, because it begins to add more depth and nuance to her character. It starts to make her more interesting. A bit of a lighter one, probably good to balance out from the previous two episodes. Ugh. I'm gonna put it here on the list. Episode 24, Sock Opera. Oh man, Sock Opera. This is a big one. 
Mabel's got a new crush, surprise surprise, and decides to put on a sock puppet rock opera with lights, original music, and live pyrotechnics to impress him. Meanwhile, Dipper is stuck trying to get into the laptop recovered from the bunker, and he gets an offer to help from good old Bill Cipher. Honestly, even more than Dreamscapers, I consider this THE key Bill Cipher episode. We get to see more of his bubbly psychopathy at display, but more than just that, he also proves genuinely cunning. When Dipper runs out of password attempts, the laptop threatens to erase itself, and what many people, me included, think might be a subtle dream induced by Bill in this very moment here, just before he more flamboyantly appears. He will give Dipper help in exchange for just a single puppet, and when Dipper is uncertain, Bill begins to call back to previous moments where Dipper had to do something to help her save Mabel. He's such a silver-tongued deceiver that he even poisoned real-life fandom discourse. Dipper finally accepts, he finds out the puppet in question is himself. Of course, by the end, Mabel realizes what's happened, and saves Dipper from Bill's evil control, even if it means trashing her rock opera and ruining her chances with the puppet guy. It feels like at this point they had Bill's character down, and it makes him seem like a far more dangerous threat than he seemed after Dreamscapers. Also, this moment where he actually smashes the laptop? God, I felt that. A lead in the mystery being so dramatically destroyed. And it stays destroyed, by the way. There's no undo button on this. Know what? Ah, to heck with it. Gets a new top spot. Seuss and the real girl. Seuss is under pressure from his grandma to find a date. I would like to see you settled before I ascend to heaven and live with the angels. And with grandpa. No, he is not there. <laughs> yeah, this episode has some really funny lines. Anyways, in an effort to improve his confidence with women, Seuss decides to try a dating simulator game that turns out to be alive, but he also meets a real person whom he hits it off with very well. Melody is honestly really sweet, and although we don't see a lot of her after this episode, I like the chemistry she has with Seuss. Of course, the dating simulator girl is jealous, and decides to bring all the animatronics to life to try and attack Seuss. In case you're wondering, Yes, this episode did come out between Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and 2. Considering these episodes each take about a year to make, it's just amazing timing on the production team's part. Anyways, cool episode, Giffany, or Jiffany, is a great villain, and it's nice to see Seuss get the spotlight. Little Gift Shop of Horrors. This is another anthology episode with three shorts stitched together. Honestly, I like this better than Bottomless Pit. I remember the three shorts here more than I recall the others. I especially love Clay Day, and the way they incorporated claymation into the show, and again make use of the clashing mediums to have fun moments. A little lighter on the story, but still very enjoyable. Episode 27. So this is where things start to get real. If you've been watching carefully this season, you find these symbols. Strange graffiti around town. This is the Society of the Blind Eye, who dedicate themselves to erasing the memories of the town residents to free them from their fear. As Dipper struggles for clues, Mabel finds something in the broken remains of the laptop. A name, McGucket. And this kooky old comic relief man is suddenly thrust into the spotlight as someone of possible import. They all raid the headquarters of the Society of the Blind Eye to find McGucket's memories. And when we see them, we find that McGucket used to be an upstanding and coherent man, but was driven mad by his collaboration with the author. And let me tell you, this episode really flexes the kind of story this show has built up. We get to this gag here. Formed many years ago by our founder... Our founder... Does anyone remember who he was? A joke, right? And certainly not a way to set up for the reveal that McGucket founded the society. McGucket built this device. It builds off of what we've seen McGucket be capable of before. This sequence made my jaw drop. It's a true gut punch. This sequence brought the whole show up another level, because now there's a realization that any of these other characters could potentially be harboring a dark secret. And this episode was pivotal, and it started what I like to call the not-what-they-seem arc, which isn't so much a single arc, but a string of episodes that begin to flesh out more characters. Society of the Blind Eye, I'd say, takes a new top spot for itself, completely redefining a character and giving important new clues for the mystery as a whole. Episode 28, Blend-In's Game. 
The twins find out it's Seuss's birthday and try to throw him a surprise party, which he does not take very well. It turns out he hates his birthday for unknown reasons. When they try and cheer him up a different way, they get trapped by Blendon from the Time Traveler's Pig, who wants time revenge on them for causing time havoc and ruining his time life. Along the way, Dipper and Mabel go back in time and see what ruined Seuss's birthday. It was the day he realized his father wasn't going to be coming back to see him. That's... actually really sad. And it's delivered in a subtle yet devastating way. So they decide to battle in the Globna Arena and win not only their lives and the ability to decide whether to spare Blendon, which they do, but also to win the Time Wish to give to Seuss. Don't get me wrong, Seuss already had some depth and complexity before this episode, but Blendon's game shows a whole other tragic side to him, and it also adds new context to his relationship with Stan. It's shown before that he views Stan as a sort of father figure. I wonder what Stan's thinking about right now. I love Seuss like a son! But this episode really deepens that, especially with the end credits stinger. Not to mention, it's just fun to see Gravity Falls from a decade ago. I'm going to put this in the upper half of episodes for now. 29. The Love God The whole friend group is getting ready for a big awesome music festival, but Robbie is still mourning his breakup with Wendy. Mabel feels bad for him, and tries to help him find true love again with the help of a mysterious cherubim. This episode isn't quite as high stakes as others in this season, but I do like that it gives Robbie, Dipper's rival in the first season, a bit more background. It turns out he's actually not such a bad guy. It's a bit weaker of an episode, but it does have the greatest Gravity Falls moment with Stan here. Alright, let her rip! <laughs> oh no, a letter rip! What the H?! <laughs> I eat kids, but we're kids! It's heaven's punishment for our terrible taste in everything! Honestly, when I try to recommend the series to people, I show them this clip and promise them there's more where that came from. As a whole, though, I'm gonna put this episode right about here. Episode 30, Northwest Mansion Mystery. Or is it Northwest Mansion Noir? Who's to say? Pacifica's family is planning to hold a big fancy party for their rich friends, but a ghost begins to torment them, so they enlist the mystery twins to help. Dipper is at first quite confident, not believing it's a particularly serious ghost. That delusion is corrected very quickly. Ancient sins, ancient sins, ancient blood and blackened skies, the forest dark shall once more rise. What do we do? What do we do? Don't worry. It can't get worse than this! <gasps> Holy shit! Yeah, this episode brings the creep factor. And it's so good. It also has a really interesting story behind the ghost. Like, I could see this being the conceit of a legitimate horror movie. So the plot is good. What about the characters? Well, 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 well. This is Pacifica's episode. She and Dipper have great chemistry together. It's a lot of fun to watch them kind of snipe at each other. But after finding a hidden room, Pacifica realizes that not only is her original family legacy built on a lie, but every Northwest has continued that legacy through lying and cheating and exploitation. That's why the ghost is attacking them, and she is worried about what that means for her. We see that her parents are controlling and demand absolute obedience. They made me! I should have told you, but... Excuse me, but what the actual heck? I like this because to a kid, you don't get the full and dark nature of what this implies. But as an adult, you do. That's what makes this series worth watching even for older viewers. Being for both adults and kids doesn't mean having raunchy jokes. It doesn't even mean having nightmare-inducing visuals. It means having these subtle moments where it doesn't have to show the more mature elements, but any adult will realize what's going on. But Pacifica finally does stand up to her parents. Even after the ghost proves too much for Dipper and Mabel to handle, Pacifica is the one who saves the day, turning her back on her family's terrible legacy and taking the first step to becoming a better person. The only thing that holds this episode back is that the stuff with Mabel and her friends competing over this boy isn't as strong, but the main plot of this episode is honestly amazing. This is a new top episode for me, 
It really showcases all the strengths of the show. Who knows how they're going to top this one. You know that cipher we all showed you earlier that flashes on the screen at the beginning of every episode? If you decipher this code right here, it says, Stan is not what he seems. From the very first episode, we can see that he's had something to hide. And in this season, we keep getting flashes to him with this mysterious device, building up to something, saying that he's going to pull this off and no one's going to get in his way. Northwest Mansion Mystery ends with McGucket pulling Dipper aside, screaming about the impending end times, and a dramatic shot of this tapestry in the Northwest family's home. And now, we're here. Episode 31, Not What He Seems. This is the episode where it all comes together. This is the episode that the entire series has been building up to. This is what it all hinges on. So how is it? Oh, you know, I don't know how to I say this um it's maybe the best 22 minutes of western animation to ever air on tv the feds have finally caught up to stan nailing him for stealing nuclear waste and dipper and mabel have to try and prove his innocence and instead accidentally prove his guilt and along the way they find a box of fake identities and this jaw-dropping moment We knew that Stan couldn't be fully trusted, but this blew away everything we had expected at the time. All of a sudden, we don't know who we're dealing with, and the agent's insistence that he's building a doomsday device suddenly seems very possible. Stan was a crook, but could he really be a villain too? The twins and Seuss find the vending machine lair. They find the other journals. They find the device. And they move to shut it down just before Stan gets home. And what follows is a powerfully dramatic moment. Dipper feels betrayed by what he's found out. After promising no more secrets, Stan deceived them again. In fact, he doesn't even think this is Stan. Was everything they ever shared only a ruse? And it makes sense for Dipper to think that. He's hurt. He's wounded. Logically, he shouldn't trust Stan. But Mabel, just before Mabel hits the button, Stan delivers this heartfelt plea to her. I wanted to say that you're gonna hear some bad things about me, and some of them are true. But trust me, everything I've worked for, everything I care about, it's all for this family. Look into my eyes, Mabel. You really think I'm a bad guy? Everything they shared, all those laughs, all those conflicts they pressed through, all those moments they came together as a family, all of it. She doesn't want it to be fake. It can't be fake. And so... I trust you. In this big moment, where literally the fate of the universe is on the line, she doesn't side with her brother. She listens to Stan and her heart over Dipper. And she's right for it, because the world isn't destroyed. Instead, the device activates a portal, and out comes a mysterious figure who bends down and places his six-fingered hand on the cover of Journal 1. What? The journals. My brother. And then the show went on hiatus for a few months. Yeah, being a Gravity Falls fan was basically pain back in the day. But anyways, everything in this episode is basically perfect. Nothing feels out of place. Nothing feels extraneous. This is what 30 episodes have built towards, and it's glorious. Not What He Seems takes an already great series and uplifts it to even greater heights. This is the new number one episode for me, and, spoiler alert, it's going to stay there for the rest of the video. I have said before that most of these episodes are near the same quality. This is an outlier. A true standard of excellence. After that blowout of a climax came A Tale of Two Stands, a special episode that's a full 30 minutes. For context, most cartoon episodes only come to about 22 or 24 minutes in order for commercials to be aired in the breaks. But this episode was just so jam-packed with story that it got to be longer. And it's a pretty damn good one. This episode is unique because it's basically all lore. Not what he seems left us with many, many questions. And A Tale of Two Stands gives us many, many answers. We find out that Stan is actually Stanley, and his twin brother is Stanford, or Ford for short. 
We find out the truth of Stan's backstory with Ford, how they had dreamed of sailing around the world together to find treasure, how they were driven apart by Stan's mistake and their cruel parents. We find out more about what McGucket went through. We see how Stan basically caused his brother to be stuck between dimensions, and how he became Mr. Mystery as a cover for 30 years in order to undo his mistake. And looking back, it's possible to see this twist being foreshadowed as early as Episode 2. A lot of people had theorized that Stan had a secret twin brother, which is a sign of a good twist. It should be possible to guess what a twist is going to be before it happens. After about three years of build-up, these were satisfying answers to get, especially to the big mystery of the show. And I think what makes this work is that there are still some questions. When McGucket got accidentally sucked through the portal, he comes out and only says this. When gravity falls and Earth becomes sky, fear the beast with just one eye. Which, you know, there's someone in the show with only one eye. That's right. Lazy Susan, the central figure to the sprawling conspiracy. But for real, this begins to add more questions about Bill's role in all this. And there's still tension between Stan and Ford, but also now, tension between Dipper and Mabel, with the latter afraid they might end up diverging the same way the Stan twins did. The nature of the show changes here, because again, the main mystery has been solved. Front and center now is the family drama, and the creeping realization that something truly sinister is on the horizon. And I think this transition is done pretty neatly. It feels like a natural outgrowth of all that's transpired. The thing is, it's hard to really judge this episode in comparison to the others because of its unique nature. It's basically all exposition. If I had to rate it based on how it adds to the overall narrative and in the context of the entire series, I'd put it just above Society of the Blind Eye. But in terms of rewatchability just on its own, I'd probably put it just below Irrational Treasure. Eh, uh, uh, what the hell, I'll average them. It's my ranking list, I can do what I want with it. Now from here, things start to normalize a bit. Episode 33 is Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons. Dipper wants to play his pen and paper RPG, but no one wants to join him, until he finds a fellow nerd in Great Uncle Ford. But Ford's infinity sided die ends up bringing the game's villains to life, and Mabel and Stan and Grenda have to go get them back. This episode is trying to tie in Ford more with the rest of the cast, since he is a late addition to the show. But I think what makes this work better is the fact that He's not really a late addition to the show. This isn't like Fairly Odd Parents where they just shoveled on new characters and in increasingly desperate attempts to stay relevant. Ford is the author of the journals, and the author has been a known factor since episode one. Through his books and the things and people he's left behind, we've been able to get glimpses of what Ford is like before he even appeared. This episode also introduces The Rift, a small tear in space-time which is a significant hazard. Ford shows it to Dipper, and specifically asks him to not tell Mabel. Again, the drama coming in more, and starting to pull the twins apart. It's a nice cooldown after some really heavy hitting stuff, but that said, it doesn't feel quite as strong overall. I'm going to slide it a little further down the list. The Stanchurian Candidate. The mayor of Gravity Falls kicks the bucket, and Stan has dreams of stepping up to the role. But Bud Gleeful, Lil Gideon's father, competes with him in the campaigns, with help behind the scenes from Lil Gideon himself. This episode unfortunately breaks all suspension of disbelief because it shows Stan facing political consequences for his criminal behavior. Despite winning an overwhelming 95% of the vote, election officials had to disqualify him due to discovery of an extensive criminal record. Zero out of ten, completely unbelievable. No, no, I'm kidding. This episode's pretty good. You got your creepy, you got your funny, and you start to feel Ford settling in more into the cast. It's so funny how entirely nonplussed he is about everything. As long as you wear the matching one, he'll say and do whatever you want him to. Thank you, Great Uncle Ford! Yes, yes. Use it responsibly and all. The episode also brings Gideon back into the fold after over a dozen episodes away from the show, getting ready for him to be in the finale, invoking Bill Cipher, escalating the situation. I'm gonna fit this in right about here, I think. Episode 35, The Last Mabel Corn. Bill finally makes an appearance again, promising Ford that he's going to get hold of the rift and cause chaos. Man, the show looks really good at times. Anyways, Ford mobilizes the whole family against Bill, 
He installed a metal plate in his own head for protection, but he decides to resort to less invasive measures for the rest of the family, seeking to both build a barrier around the mystery shack and to encode in their minds against his infiltration. Mabel and her friends go to get unicorn hair, and ingredients needed to build the barrier. However, the unicorn accuses Mabel of not being pure of heart. She does whatever she can to prove herself. None of it is enough. Then it turns out that the unicorns are just bluffing, and it devolves into an all-out brawl, and the girls have to trade for magic drugs. Yeah, this is exactly how I imagined Gravity Falls would approach the majestic unicorn. I wonder what Dipper is up to in his B-plot. Well, you know, not much. Just finding out that Ford made a deal with Bill and led him into his mind! Yeah, this was kind of a huge holy shit moment. And I love how we can see how Dipper and Mabel are diverging in this moment. Mabel told Stan, I trust you. But all Dipper can think is... Trust no one. Trust no one. Trust no one. What Ford had written in Journal 3. But luckily, Ford manages to have an explanation. He did used to work with Bill. Until he realized he was being used to create a portal that would allow Bill to invade their world. And the true scale of what's at stake is finally revealed. And it ends with Bill going... I guess I can't possess anyone inside the shack, so I'll just have to find my next pawn on the outside. This is a great episode. Really strong, winding up the tension and delivering more great character moments for the cast. It goes pretty high up on the list. I can't wait to see what comes after that big cliffhanger. Oh, no. Okay, so roadside attraction is weird. And I'll be upfront, this is the one Gravity Falls episode I don't really care for. Way back when, Alex Hirsch even tweeted saying that this is going to be a more low-key episode before things really went off the rails in the one after. And yeah, this feels like a rather abrupt de-escalation. Also, it's weirdly placed in the timeline. As long as we're inside, our minds are safe. This year we're visiting every tourist trap along the Redwood Highway. There's no mention of Bill or the Rift. And sure, maybe you want an episode in between major story beats to let them breathe. That makes sense. That's what happened a lot in season one, and that worked well. But at least have Ford appear in this episode. Anyways, the actual story is that the family is going on a road trip so Stan can sabotage his tourist trap competitors. Dipper, meanwhile, is... still hung up on 1D. <sighs> finally passed all this. Yeah, that's how I feel too. And like, sure, it makes sense that it's hard for him to just turn off those feelings, and he might be struggling with that. But it's been over a dozen episodes since that breakup, so it feels weird to just suddenly bring it up again. Stan tries to get him over it by encouraging him to flirt with girls on their trip. And like, I guess that's kind of scummy. I don't know, I'm not familiar with the rules of flirting. I'm an antisocial shut in who's talking about a children's cartoon on the internet. I don't know how these things work. But what happens is that as he flirts, suddenly Candy becomes enamored with him. He's roped into this rendezvous with her against his will, and then when he gets found out by the rest of the girls he flirted with, everyone treats him as if he betrayed Candy. But he never tried to charm her. He's called out and punished for something that he didn't do. And that's so odd to me. None of the other episodes have this kind of problem with their storytelling. Also, the fact that it doesn't even take place in Gravity Falls just feels so weird. Or not weird, because Gravity Falls is the weird place, but y you know what I mean. The episode still has some good lines, and the spider lady is pretty scary, but the stars just didn't align for this one. I feel like this could have been a Pacifica episode, maybe see how she's doing, or a Ford episode, or even both. Yeah, this is easily the weakest episode of the series for me, and there's a significant gulf of quality between this and Headhunters. Luckily, episode 37 picks things up again, Dipper and Mabel versus the future. Dipper goes with Ford on a mission to repair the rift, which is starting to crack. Meanwhile, Mabel begins to go around to invite everyone to their 13th birthday. Dipper saves Ford from an alien security system and gets invited to become his assistant, getting to live in Gravity Falls permanently. Mabel's day sours, though. Her friends aren't coming to her party. She realizes that as she becomes a teenager, things are going to get more stressful. And then she finds out that her brother might not be coming home with her to see it all through. And thus we see the breaking point. As mentioned before, Dipper's eager to lock himself into studying under Ford, jumping forward in his life. 
Mabel is afraid of moving forward. She wants things to stay the same. Look, things aren't gonna stay frozen this way. It's part of growing up. Things change. Summer ends. And that line also has a more meta meaning. Gravity Falls, the show, is coming to an end. This episode brings us past the 90% mark. Gravity Falls only covers one summer. It was never meant to become a long-running behemoth like other series. But Mabel doesn't want summer to end. She runs out of the shack, accidentally grabbing Dipper's backpack in the process. But as she hides out in the forest in despair, she hears a voice. I, I can help! You once did a favor for me, so I thought I could help you out. It's called a time bubble, and it prevents time from going forward. Summer and Gravity Falls can last as long as you want it to. Keep in mind, she's a 12-year-old who's had a really bad day. She's found out that she's about to lose all these people she cares about. And this guy does kind of owe them. It's a short-sighted idea, but again, she's 12. And why shouldn't she offer him this weird little doodad that Ford specifically asked Dipper to not tell her about? She doesn't know what it is or what it does. What could possibly go wrong? I wish you could have seen the fandom when this episode aired. Yeah, this is kind of a great episode of Return to Form. Put it near the top there. And now we're at Expixiviax. Weird Mageddon Part 1. Bill has been unleashed on the universe, and he wastes no time in causing chaos and carnage. That's a great offer! How about instead I shuffle the functions of every hole in your face? His corrupting influence even invades the title sequence. I loved this little touch. Dipper and Ford try to take down the Dream Demon. It goes horribly wrong. Dipper manages to escape and find Wendy, and they resolve to save Mabel, whom Bill has trapped in a giant bubble. But in their path is Gideon, who appears to have gotten his freedom and returned for being Bill's enforcer. We get a great Mad Max-esque chase scene before they're cornered. But in a last-ditch attempt, Dipper tries to appeal to Gideon and asks him what he believes Mabel would want him to do. This, combined with his assertions that Gideon is afraid of Bill, manages to convince him to turn on the evil equilateral. Now this is admittedly a bit of a heel turn, and it could have used a bit more setup, but it does still make some level of sense. His obsession and possessiveness over Mabel is what's driven him, and even if he has her in his grasp, he's realizing that it's not in the way he wanted, and that maybe what he wanted isn't truly attainable. Again, more space to let it breathe would have been nice, but the beats are there. This episode is really a jolt, shaking up the world of Gravity Falls and marking the beginning of the end in a number of ways. Fits into the upper tier quite nicely. Weird Mageddon Part 2, Escape from Reality. By this point in 2015, it had been confirmed by the Harbinger of Doom that we were in the endgame, so we all knew this was the penultimate episode, and that began to make things more emotional to us. As Bill finds his expansion blocked by a mysterious force field, Dipper and Wendy and Seuss find that the bubble Mabel is trapped in is a personalized paradise of Bill's design. Nothing is ever wrong. You can create whatever fantasy you want with your imagination. But Dipper knows that they can't stay there, and so a trial is held, pitting fantasy against reality. And we see moments from their past where both Mabel's heart and Dipper's heart were broken. Times they were bullied. And yeah, things are hard out there, and Mabel's afraid to face that again. But Dipper has a counter-argument. Through every hardship they faced, they faced it together, and they made it easier to bear. And that's when he tells her that he's not accepting Ford's apprenticeship. He's not leaving her. They will be going home together. And at this moment, both of their arcs meet. Dipper was so eager to grow up. He was ready to become a hero like Ford said he could. But he got in way over his head. He 
He wasn't ready. That's what the last episode taught him. This episode teaches Mabel that what she wants isn't healthy. She doesn't have to be afraid of the future. Just like always, the two of them make amends, and it breaks the spell of Mabel Land once and for all. And keep in mind, even after everything is settled, she does tell him that if he really wants, he can take that apprenticeship, but he still declines. A really great dramatic episode, which wraps up Dipper and Mabel's conflict in a way that I found satisfying. The episode also has the added bonus of including easter eggs from previous moments in the series, so it's fun finding those. Another solid entry in the three-part finale. And speaking of finales, episode 40, Weird Mageddon Part 3, Take Back the Falls. Sometimes it gets split into two episodes on re-airings, but it initially ran as a single double-length episode, so I'll be discussing it as such. Now let's get my complaints out of the way. I do feel like Pacifica gets shortchanged here. She had some great character growth in her last appearance, and while she's not completely reset, it does feel like she's walked back for the sake of some gags. Also, there's a bit of a stand at the end that feels like it could have used more time to breathe. I'll get to that later. So those are my complaints with the finale. Now for the things I like about it. This finale is so cool, oh my god. All the characters from previous episodes have taken refuge in the mystery shack, and they turn the building into a giant mecha to battle Bill since the shielding they installed still works against him. But they have to hurry because he's torturing Ford for the key to escaping the town's confines. And that means not global destruction, but truly cosmic destruction. And so everyone rallies together. It's like a big, huge deluge of Gravity Falls. I guess you could see it's like Avengers Endgame, if Avengers Endgame was actually the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They manage to distract Bill long enough to rescue Ford, and he reveals the last way to defeat the Terrible Triangle, the famous cipher wheel from the very beginning. Everyone joins hands, except Stan. Stan has been sore this entire time. He saved Ford from extra-dimensional peril once already, I got a punch in the face and a verbal eviction notice. He's been shown up time and again through this arc. All he wants is a thank you from Ford, any indication at all that his brother values him. And finally, Ford begrudgingly relents. Fine. Thank you. Ah, see? Between me and him, I'm not always the bad twin. Between him and me. Grammar Stanley. Oh, Grammar Stanley, you! Yes! Yeah, so this breaks the circle and Bill shows up, turning all the supporting cast into trophy banners, and threatens worse for the kids unless Ford gives him what he wants. Luckily, the twins manage to slip away at least momentarily. You two wait here! I've got some children I need to make into corpses! See you real soon! No! Wait, no, no! Remember when a spin the bottle joke was considered too risque for this show? Anyways, Stan breaks down, lamenting his own hot-headedness. They wonder aloud about how well the kids can work together and try to think of a way out. But the resources are limited. There's only so much they can do. And so, when Bill returns with Dipper and Mabel and selects one of them to die then and there, Ford surrenders. He shakes hands with Bill granting free access to his mind and the secrets needed to bring the universe to ruin. Or at least, that might be how it seems to viewers who didn't notice that Stanley suddenly got a sixth finger. That's right, they did a switcheroo, and Stan sacrifices his mind to be erased with Bill inside. And you know what's so cool about this? Every member of the Pines family has made a deal with Bill. Every single one but only one of them was a smart enough con man to trick the devil himself. Bill is obliterated, Weird Mageddon is reversed, the sky clears, and Stan is left kneeling on the ground, but without any memory of who he is or what he's done. He doesn't remember the kids, he doesn't remember Ford, and now that he's lost Stan, Ford finally realizes what he's done. Stan has no idea, but he did it. He saved the world. He saved me. You're our hero, Stanley. It's such a heart-wrenching moment. And as they bring him back to the ruins of the Mystery Shack, it's a wonder to see how far the story has come. It really feels like so much has happened. A long journey has been taken. A journey with real consequences. 
Mabel, in desperation, grabs her scrapbook and tries to bring back Stan's memories. And it, it works. Yeah, this is the thing I mentioned before. It feels like this resolves a little too quickly. Hirschman stated that it seems overly cruel to have Stan lose his memories permanently. And I totally agree. But it does feel like it's maybe a bit too clean and complete. Just some tweaking might have made it feel like a bit more of a monumental process to rebuild and kept the same effect. At the same time though, it's not like he knew this was going to happen, so the sacrifice still means something. Again, that's like my only other complaint about the finale. But later on, Ford takes Stan behind the shack. As kids, Stan and Ford had dreamed of sailing around the world together. And now, at long last, Ford invites him to do exactly that. With him. And so the show ends with the most important dramatic conflicts being resolved. Not every mystery is answered, like this key that Dipper got from Quentin Tremblay in Season 1, but all the important mysteries are solved, and the ones that are left are the type that are fun to ponder and speculate about. And I'm gonna put this episode right about here, still near the top. So that completes the list, which I'll scroll up the screen now. Again, episodes near the bottom of the list still have a lot of things I like, and given how many of the top 10 episodes are in the second season, you can see that the show really ended on such a high note. But I still want to linger here, at the final moments of the series. As the twins say goodbye to their grunkles, Stan and Ford, to the friends they've made, we also say goodbye. And in the end, I say goodbye with satisfaction in my heart. Is Gravity Falls a perfect series? No, it's got a few issues. I've already talked about most of them. And there's a few times where the jokes undercut what could be a more impactful scene, I'll admit that. But, in a sense, it is perfect to me. Every flaw I see is balanced by dozens of strengths. Every moment that doesn't land is countered by a hundred moments that left me rolling in laughter, pressed back in horror, or leaning forward in wild anticipation. And I've not even covered the interseason shorts, the books, the real-life cipher puzzle hunt that Alex Hirsch put on. I also didn't cover the amazing shorts from the Mystery of Gravity Falls YouTube channel and all the great fan works from the amazing community. Not to mention the great real friends I made along the way. Gravity Falls was more than a show. It was an experience. Ten years on from its premiere, the series holds a special place in my heart. And it always will. If you're new to the fandom, I'd recommend looking for all the stuff I just mentioned. Browse through the fan wiki because there's so many great details and easter eggs that I didn't cover. There's so many great memories that you can take part in too. If you're curious, don't wait. Take a look. Find it. It's out there somewhere on the web. Waiting. Stay weird everybody. <laughs>